Perfect. Um, well, thank you all for joining. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you, everyone, for, for, like I said, sticking with us and welcome to the Research on Humane Fisheries session. Uh, for those of you who have been here throughout the day, welcome back. For those of you who are just joining for this last session, my name is Tessa Gonzalez and I'm the senior researcher at the Aquatic Life Institute. And some housekeeping reminders that all of you have, have heard throughout today. As an attendee, you are muted upon entry with your cameras off. Please use the Q&A box to post your questions throughout the discussion. We do have time allocated to answer your questions after both speakers have finished their presentations. Every session is being recorded. And during the Aquatic Life Conference, we aim for respectful and productive discussions. And there's zero tolerance for harassment or discrimination of any kind. With that being said, our team at the Aquatic Life Institute will be closely monitor monitoring the Zoom chat and Whova during the conference. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, please feel free to send us a direct message. This last session is about 45 minutes long, and we have two wonderful panelists with us today. Dr. Marco Vindas from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences and Dr. Nicola Randall from Harper Adams University. Without further ado, I will take up no more time and hand it over to you, Marco. Thank you very much. Let me see. You should be able to see my presentation now. Looks good. Okay, excellent. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I thought today I would tell you a little bit about our approach to try to increase the welfare in wild fishermen. Um, and the topic of this talk is how to understand the emotional and cognitive experience that a fish may be processing or feeling, uh, if you want to say it that way, uh, when they get fished in different ways. So. Um, <clears throat> Of course, I mean, this has been already talked uh, quite a bit uh, already, I'm sure, but um, I just thought that I would just quickly introduce the whole animal welfare uh, that was presented by Fraser in 1997. Uh, we have three different sort of bubbles that we have to take into account. And while biological function and natural living is of course a very important part, what we're trying to focus on here is the last area, the affective states. Um, in parentheses, they, they put an example of happiness, like how would you actually be able to judge the happiness in, in an animal? In our case, it's not necessarily only, only the happiness, but just trying to understand how uh, the brain is being activated and in that way, uh, trying to interpret that in terms of how they are feeling in general. So, of course, when we try to adapt welfare to fisheries, uh, it's, it can be difficult because of basically the way uh, we practice fisheries. It, it's generally speaking quite a stressful experience for an animal to be caught and manipulated that way. Um, but there is, of course, uh, more and more focus on this uh, from every single lead along the line. Um, and the idea here is to have sustainable fisheries and that also includes increasing the welfare for the fish. So of course, this has not always been the case. Uh, I always like to show this, uh, for example, it's a typical uh, example with Kirk Cobain sings in one of his songs, uh, it's okay to eat fish because they don't have any feelings. Um, and the idea here is that the emotions, not necessarily the feelings, but emotions are something that all animals display. Feelings is what we humans, how we interpret our emotions. And of course, it's not easy for us to interpret or to try to understand if a fish feels the same way, but we can definitely study their emotions. Um, but when we see a fish, it's not necessarily that we know if they are sad or if they are scared or happy or angry. Just by looking at the facial expression of a fish, it's not easy to understand what's going on. 
uh, they might be thinking something really complicated for all we know. So how is it that we try to understand them, how, how they, um, they experience their world? Of course, we have behavior. Uh, this has been studied quite broadly now, and we can obviously gain a lot of insight from this. But what we think is that behavior by itself is not enough, and you need to have some physiology, and in this case, neurobiology. And of course, even though a fish brain is very different from a human brain, uh, we actually know that there are a lot of the same elements found in the brains. They both have a front brain where you have the amygdala or hippocampus. It's called differently in fish, but they have a functional equivalent to those and so on and so forth. And that means that if we can see the activation in some of these areas and we can relate it to how humans are activated in similar situations, then we understand what's going on with the fish. So a classical example is looking at the amygdala and hippocampus. Like I said, they are called a little bit different than fish, but if you see um, a slice of a fish brain, it would look something like this. And you have these areas there. And we know that these areas uh, have to do with emotional control, have to do with memory and learning, with reward, and goal-oriented behavior. So again, this gives us a clue of what is going on in a fish brain. Now, one approach that we do is looking at the neuronal activity, which areas are being activated to a given situation. And for this, we use, for example, immediate early genes. So it's these are markers that get activated very shortly after, after something happens when a neuron is being activated. So we can mark them, as you can see. I don't know if you can see my pointer. Um, maybe I should do this. So um, over here, we have an area where you have these markings. Every single marking is a neuron that's being activated. Now, one of the problems with using this type of, um, of marker, like in this case, CFOS, is that it takes about half an hour or an hour to get a good real marking. So one of the um, things that we are using now is, um, is this uh, endogenous kinase called uh, PERC for short, phosphorylated extracellular signal regulated kinase. And this basically marks the cell, the neurons, very, very quickly after they are being activated. And that means that we can potentially understand what's going on after a fish gets fished. Uh, not only if it's been on a hook for X amount of time, but also if it's on the hook for only five minutes. And in this way, we can understand exactly what, uh, what, go, go, what goes on in the fish brain. In addition, if we are able to map the neural areas that are activated, we can also micro dissect these areas and we can check the neurochemistry uh, in the brain. We can look at dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline, for example. Um, and all of these are very important in the regulation of behavior and physiology. Um, in addition, of course, we can also micro dissect the brain to look at genes. Uh, we know that the expression of genes has to do with uh, the different proteins that are being formed, and this also gives us an idea of what's going on. In the brain. So again, we're just trying to find different markers, different things that may help us understand the experience that the fish is um, having. And of course, uh, the stress response is uh, very, very important in this case because it's a stressful, uh, it's a stressful um, um, situation that they are uh, experiencing. So we can look at cortisol, the stress hormone that is being released uh, by the by the brain. Basically, it's it's controlled by the hypothalamus, and then we can take all these things and put them together. Um, together with behavior and understand the subjective experience of being fished. And this is basically what we're doing in uh, one of our projects where we're looking at cod fisheries. Uh, in this project, we're looking at different types of uh, the way they catch cod. It may be by a long line, it may be by a troll, uh, it may be just like a, 
putting the fish, the, the net down and bringing it up. Um, Danish sign is called, and uh, or it could be by a fish cage. So the idea is to collect different fish from all these uh, different techniques and then look at the brain and see if it's being activated in different ways. And again, we are uh, also trying to figure out how the fish are processed and if that also makes um, an impact on the welfare of the fish. So in many fishing boats, what they do is just they cut the uh, throat and they bleed the, um, the fish out. And this may take longer for some fish to die than others. Um, however, we have, for example, a collaboration with this boat that we have a picture of. Uh, it's a very high-tech uh, boat that they have here in Norway. And they have a stunning machine on board. What they use is they catch the fish, they stun the fish, and then they cut them and, got, and, and bleed them out. So the idea behind this is that they would be unconscious uh, by the uh, electric shock and that that is better for welfare. Uh, unfortunately, this has not, has not been tested properly, and this is part of what we are wanting to do here. We want to do we want to use some of these methods that I had spoken to you guys about, and test if indeed the welfare of fish is better this way. Again, we are doing uh, we are doing diving to look at the different uh, fish in these uh, settings. We are looking. We are having. Uh, over here, we have a camera uh, that we use with different hooks, for example, and then we see how the fish react to this. Um, we're measuring the behavior, we're measuring the, the neurobiology of the fish. And this is uh, something that is not only um, going on in uh, Norway. We are currently trying to expand our project to include also Iceland. Because, of course, when it comes to fisheries, the fish have no country. It's a big ocean and it's, they've been exploited in different ways. We want to make sure that we try to get as much as possible. So again, the idea behind this project is to try to understand which of these fishing methods may be more beneficial or if there is a difference at all between the methods. Um, finally, uh, one thing that we also would like to sort of like incorporate into this project is a very interesting uh, uh, prototype that has been developed for the tuna fisheries, uh, in which this is for artisanal uh, fishing, fishing. And what they do is that because the tuna can be so big, if they get uh, a really big fish, it might be very difficult to take it on board because they are very good at fighting, uh, of course. So what they usually do is that they leave the fish hooked for a few hours. It can take eight to 12 hours. The fish struggles and struggles and struggles, and once it's exhausted, then they can pull it out. So what they have done is that they have developed um, a ring that you can send down to the fish once it's hooked, and then it gives it an electrical shock. Immediately, the fish is motionless. It's uh, completely, completely unconscious. Then they can take it up and process it. And basically, this diminishes the time that the fish struggles dramatically. And our idea here would be to try to develop a similar technique for cod fishing. And in that way, uh, dramatically improve the welfare of the fish that are, that are at least being fished by, for example, long life. Um, so, this is just a quick overview of the sort of um, of uh, project that uh, projects that we we are trying to develop in 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 order to increase the welfare of fish by understanding the emotional and cognitive experience of the fish. This is a collaboration with uh, several institutes here, and basically that's it for my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Marco. That was great. I had an, I, tuna fishing is a, a large issue in and of itself. Um, so that's really interesting that work is being done to try and minimize suffering as much as we can in that area because they're such magnificent animals and they're huge. <laughs> so developing a solution is just such a challenge. Um, 
especially with like you said artisanal fisheries they just don't have the the same resources that large fishing fleets do um so yeah i'm excited to hear more about that for sure yeah that's uh actually the, the interesting thing is that this company developed this uh not to increase the welfare but to make the life of the fisher people uh easier but at the same time it increases the welfare so it's a it's a win-win for everyone yes it's like many aspects of welfare are win-win for producers and consumers and fishers and obviously the animals themselves yes. um thank you so much and we'll have time for questions at the end I'd like to hand it over to Nicola. Nicola, are you able to, um, oh, there we are. Yes, I'm here. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I think I should be able to share this myself. So but if I have a problem, I'll let you know. Okay, great. So can people see that okay? Yes, looks good. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so thanks very much. And um, really interesting to hear Marco there because some of this um, work that we've been doing links to some of the things he was talking about. So um, I should probably say I'm not a fish specialist. I'm actually a method specialist um in carrying out ways of gathering evidence and synthesizing them and so we were um, commissioned to do this piece of work um, looking at a review and feasibility analysis of humane stunning in wild capture fisheries um, oh. oh yes okay um, so this is the team here um, we're working on this project. So as you can see, we have quite an extensive team, which is made up of um, various different topic experts and also ourselves as um, methods experts. So our project had three different objectives. So the first one was to carry out an overview of the worldwide fish capture industry. So we can really see what the picture is at the moment. Then we carried out something called a systematic map, which collated existing evidence relating to humane stunning of wild caught fish. And then following on from that, we've been carrying out a feasibility analysis to actually look at whether or not it's possible to integrate more humane stunning methods in commercial fisheries. And if so, um, where it might be most feasible to do that. So when we were looking at fish, um, we were looking at wild fin fish. So there's been quite a lot of work carried out in um, farmed fish, but, but much less in commercial wild capture fisheries. And we were looking at fish that are being caught both for human and non-human consumption, um, because from a humane point of view, it doesn't actually make any difference what the reasons those fish are caught for. Um, we were looking on a global scale and we were looking at a variety of different killing methods as um, defined by the OIE and EFSA, as in humane methods. So I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Um, okay. So if we just look first of all at the overview of the worldwide capture fishing industry. So what we were really trying to establish is how many fish were being caught where and what types of fish. Because if we know this, we can um, then perhaps tailor what we're going to do as far as actions go more effectively. So we were looking at the tonnage of different species and the geographical distribution of their capture. And to do this, we used existing um, figures from FAO, which have actually already been converted um, by a lady called Alison Mood and her colleagues on, on something called fish stat. And we were trying to establish not not necessarily the numbers of fish, we need that as a starting point, but we want to know the numbers of individuals. Um, so we have to look at the average weight of species and then divide that into the tonnage. And that then gives us an, an idea of how many fish are captured of different species in different regions across the world. 
Um, and then in addition to that, we also looked to see what different types of fishing gears were being used, different types of killing methods, where humane stunning is already being implemented and reasons for lack of uptake of that. And what we actually found, um, which was quite shocking to me actually, was that there's over 77 million tonnes of um, fish captured each year, which when we carry out that calculation, equates to an estimated 0.9 to 2.5 trillion individual fish captured every year. Um, and marine capture is the greatest proportion of the total global, cap global capture production of that, with Asia being the biggest producer. And you can see on the graph on the um, right hand side there, how that production is distributed. If we look at species, I hope you can see this on the screen. I am working on my phone today, so it looks rather small to me, but hopefully most of you have got a better screen than I have. Um, but when we look at the top 15 fin fish which are captured, um, as in numbers of fish, what you can see here is that actually most of them are small pelagic species. So very often these are not the really high cost species, the high value species. They're smaller fish that may go into um, fish meal or fish oil, for example, or they might go for human consumption, but often the smaller fish, mackerel, herring, herring sardines, for example. Um, and the majority of those fish are not killed humanely according to guidelines set by the European Food Safety Authority and also the um, IOE. There are, however, some quite exciting um, humane stunning activities taking place. So some of these are in lab conditions, some of them are being trialled um, on boats. So for example, um, the Blue North in Alaska are looking at semi-dry electrical stunners on their boats um, so that they can then sell their fish as humanely killed and they're looking at possibilities of introducing that into other fleets. Um, we have, I'm not going to go through all of these, you can probably see them, but we have um, a company in the Netherlands, Ecofish, that again are looking at dry electrical stunners. If you go up to the top right, electro stunning devices, that's probably the most um, most commonly investigated and possibly the most viable system being looked at at the moment for fish caught in large numbers. Um, but there are other methods as well. So for example, Wild Salmon Direct are looking at automated percussive methods. Um, so very much more rapid methods of slaughtering fish um, using non-electrical methods. As far as legislation goes, it's very limited, but the Australian government are recommending um, that for ikijimi, I think I pronounced that right, which is a very high value fish, um, can, be, can be slaughtered in a more humane way. And one of the reasons that the more high value fish tend to often be slaughtered in more humane ways is because the fish the method of slaughter may also influence the um, flesh quality. So that brings us to the next part of our work, which was a systematic map. And what this does, this uses, very, for this type of method, we use very structured methodologies to try and minimize bias and make the method very transparent for what we've done. Um, in this case, we're gathering existing research evidence. We're gathering, gathering evidence from the literature. Um, and what we do here is we create a database of existing research and we pick the same information from every study so that we can compare across different to what we're looking at. And the aim of this particular systematic map was to look at the primary research literature relevant to humane stunning of wild caught fish. So um, we were looking at the stunning methods that were being used and what out were being reported. So they were primarily fish welfare outcomes 
and outcomes on flesh quality. And we also looked at some evidence of onboard stunning and some economic uh, I think we might have lost Nicola. Oh no. Um, Nicola, I'm going to give you a few minutes to see maybe if you can rejoin. Oh, there you are. <laughs> we lost you. Oh, you're you're muted right now. Right, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I dropped out for a minute there. I've turned my video off and I'm going to sit going outside. <laughs> I don't know where you lost me. Um so had you heard about the systematic map? Yes. Okay, so I will try and share that again where I was. So basically what I was um, telling you is the findings of the systematic map and I'll just zoom into one of these at a time. So the first key thing to note is that humane stunning parameters have only been tested for a very small minority of species and for a very small minority of methods. So what we know is very limited. Um, we also know that what, what happens with different species is very variable. So when people are carrying out research, they really need to be looking at species specific methods. And again, that can be quite limited because the outcomes can be very different depending on the species. Um, most of the research we found with farmed fish, not on wild captured fish. And, um, and again, aquaculture, we really need some of that knowledge transfer to come from aquaculture to go into wild capture fisheries. Um, so, and, and the other thing that's really difficult in the wild capture um, fisheries is the test the onboard testing again this is very limited so so basically the take-home message from the systematic map was that we need more research in this area in order to look to see what the benefits are for particular species but also benefits for fishermen as Marco mentioned such as things like labor saving etc okay so I'm going to move on because I think I might be out, running out of time where I dropped out now so the final part of our work was to really bring all these different pieces of work together but we've also spoken to experts spoken to fisheries um, sp spoken to retailers supermarkets producers etc and we've brought all of this thing to these this work together in order to carry out this feasibility analysis um, to try and identify where the need for stunning is greatest and where it's most likely to be feasible where is the uptake most likely to take place um, and where might methods most likely be able to be used. So the overall answer again is there is no one, one size fits all. This is a really complex area and we're not going to be able to come out with a really simple answer really quickly. There are some things we can say though. At the moment, dry electrical stunning looks to be feasible for some species and some fisheries but there are challenges so things like bycatch for example and debris can cause issues species um even fish of the same species aren't all the same size which can influence how well this works um, manual percuss percussive stunning can work for some species but it's very labor intensive. So it's much more suited, suited to the high value species that I mentioned earlier. Um, automated percuss percussive stun stunning appears to be less feasible because the fish aren't a uniform size and they need to be in many fisheries. In the future, there are lots of opportunities. So continuous flow in water electric stunning, for example, could be used to stun large volumes of wild caught fish of different sizes and in a short space of time. So this is the sort of thing that might be useful for commercial large scale fisheries. 
Um, and finally, one of the real challenges is thinking about the attitudes to fish welfare. It's only really recently that it's been acknowledged that fish are sentient, so they do feel pain, for example. So getting that message out there is quite important. Also identifying the win-win benefits. And we need more funding for research and feasibility studies and more collaboration between actual commercial fisheries and the researchers and the lab work that's going on. And I think that's it. So thank you very much for listening. And I do apologize for dropping out on you for a few minutes there. I hope it wasn't for too long. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you uh, persisting and you know sticking through that. I know technical difficulties are always very disheartening, but we really appreciate um, your time and effort and really enjoyed your talk and learning more about how we can sort of move in a progressive way towards more humane fisheries. So thank you both for, for contributing to this session. Um, we have just over about 13 more minutes for questions. So um, attendees, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A. I do have a few questions that um, I'd like to ask both of you in the meantime. One is, um, how should we start to establish research priorities? I know, Nicola, you touched on a few different areas uh, where knowledge gaps currently exist, but what exactly would this process entail and who would set these different research priorities? Um, maybe, Marco, you can uh, chime in first. Sure. Um, I thought, actually, in a way, uh, Nicola would be... Uh better to start with because she basically already lined up a little bit of, uh, of, of an answer here. Um, but uh, in my opinion, one of the most important things is consumers should dictate uh, how what they want, of course, uh, because that's that's the the biggest signal the, for something to be done. Um, but a very important aspect of, of this research is that communication between uh, us doing the research and the people fishing, the people getting the fish. So the commercial fisheries. Uh, it's, it's, if, we, if we bridge that gap between us, then uh, things get easier. And, and for example, in, in this project that I talked today, uh, we have the support of uh, three different companies which are very interested in having that you know welfare stamp on their fish so they are very interested in in collaborating and and, and trying to do to to get uh, to increase the welfare of fish as well so but but that's that that open communication that understanding of that it's beneficial for everyone is is a key factor here in order to to get the ball rolling thank you marco Nicola, would you like to add to that? Um, yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd agree with what Marco's saying. Um, and as I touched on um, at the end of the presentation there, um, one of the big issues really is, is the scalability, I think. I think that's where a lot of the research needs to fall because at the moment we can try things on small scale, but when we think about the numbers, the billions of fish that are actually captured, what we really want to be doing is thinking is how we can scale that up because it's all very well finding ways to humanely stun um, fish um, that are perhaps the high value fish, but they're very small numbers in comparison with the numbers of fish that are actually caught. Um, so I think for me, one of the things that's really come out of this is, is finding ways to actually how these how these methods that are currently being tested can be implemented on on actual real fishing vessels and it's not just whether they can be implemented it's how they can be implemented how much that costs what does it la add to labor costs but then the flip side of that is is it's been shown that it can help with safety so in some situations so it's it's really that making those the methods that are being tested really applicable, I think. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to go back to that gap that you just mentioned, Marco. What would you 
in an ideal scenario, um, how could you see that gap being filled between not only researchers, but also the industry, NGOs, policymakers? How can we appeal to them as advocates, um, you know, coming from the welfare lens in a way that they'll also realize everything is interconnected in this space? Well, I mean, to be honest, I feel like there's there's been a lot of progress done already because uh, in our experience, a lot of, we, we we worked a lot with the aquaculture industry as well, and 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 we we get the the feeling nowadays that this is easier. It's easier to communicate this. They are interested. They they understand that increasing the welfare increases the quality, uh, and. So it may be coming from another place, not necessarily the wanting to have less less uh, distressed fish uh, per se, but the end is the same. But the goal, the end goal, is the same. So I think that in general, this sort of um, platform that we have here, communicating to the general public, communicating to people that are interested in this topic, is is the a very important step. Um, at least uh, to, to bridge the gap. Great, thank you so much. We just have a few more minutes left um, and I would kind of like to ask a fun question to you both, but if resources were readily available and time and all of that wasn't necessarily a factor, what would you choose as your next research endeavor in terms of humane fisheries? No limits. <laughs> well, I mean, I can jump uh, here first. For my sake, I would like to try to improve the bycatch, especially of uh, shark, uh, sharks in general, because I love sharks. I think they're amazing. And unfortunately, either they're being cut, caught for fins, which is not really that great, um, or they're being caught as bycatch. Uh, so trying to improve the fisheries somehow so that, I mean, there's, there's a, I know there's a few projects going on here in Norway where they are using special types of hooks that basically deter uh, sharks to come and, uh, and, and get them. Uh, so, so that sort of research trying to improve that, um, doing some diving with some sharks, that would be great. <laughs> nice, thanks, Michael. Nicola? Yeah, that's a really interesting one because as I said at the beginning, I, I don't work just in this area. I work across lots of different fields. Um, but what's been really interesting, I think for me, is we were, um, we were looking specifically at the slaughter methods for this particular piece of work. But speaking to a lot of people in the industry as part of our interviews, um, one of the things that really came out was it's not just the moment of slaughter that matters. It's the whole um, the whole experience, as it were, of the fish. So um, I, I think Marco might have touched on it briefly, but um, fish often are actually not alive by the time they come onto the boats because of the way they've been caught. So, so I think for me, it's that period between capture and slaughter, that whole period and how that can be sped up and the stress for the fish reduced. Yeah, that's a great point. I think um, throughout the fisheries work that the Aquatic Life has done and that Chris um, had just talked about in the previous session, we've seen some images that are very disturbing, uh, you know, when they're being captured and retrieved, that whole retrieval process. And it's just, it's very sad to see the conditions that they're kept in and the amount of time that they're kept in those conditions before they're even brought on board. So I think, yeah, work in that area could have overarching benefits, not only for the fish being captured, but, um, you know, some of the animals that are in there as well as a result of, of bycatch and how to prevent that from happening. Thank you both so much. I just have uh, one last question. Um, should stunning be mandated 
uh, across the board, whether that be legislatively, whether it be through certification schemes, in your opinion, um, should it be mandated at this moment? I guess uh, I can start again. Um, I think it's it's I, how to put it like it's sort of dangerous to say one thing should be done because I think it's important to keep in mind that all fisheries are a little bit different. Uh, and it was like Nicola was saying when you talk about small species, it's a lot more difficult to implement something like that. So I think we should try to look for specific solutions for the different different types of fisheries. Something that is targeted, because uh, that way we can improve the welfare to that specific uh, technique, in my opinion. Yeah, I would probably agree with that. I, um, again, as a non-fish non specialist, I, I wouldn't really want to be saying you should mandate something and looking at this i it's a very complex area i think really for me the key is keeping people talking getting people working together um you know right through the food chain really so the scientists the fishermen the buyers the retailers um all these people the, the consumers everybody working together is is what's going to make a difference i think I agree with you both. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're just about at time and I just wanted to take the last few minutes to thank you both so much uh, for contributing to this session. We really appreciate your time, your energy, your insight and really value everything that um, you have to share about this really important topic. So thank you so much. And thank you to our attendees who have stuck with us throughout the day. I hope you had a wonderful day learning about all of these different areas of research and neglected species and how we can improve um, because there's always something to be done. There's always work to be done for sure. So thank you to everyone. Um, the Aquatic Life Institute, like I mentioned before and others have mentioned, we're heading to COP27 next month where we'll be calling on global leaders to prioritize aquatic animal welfare and the global goals and would love for everyone to follow our journey on LinkedIn and share our call to action across your networks. Julia has kindly pasted that in the chat for you. So this concludes the first day of the Aquatic Life Conference. Thank you again, everyone for joining. We hope to see you all tomorrow morning for me, bright and early <laughs> at 8 a.m. EST for the first session of our campaigning and policy day to discuss global coalition coordination. So set your alarms and we'll see you then. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you.